Okay, I think it's time to start. Uh, now we are going to dive into the world of uh, machine learning with Ekaterina Mikhailova. Um, what I can say about her, she loves uh, linguistic very much, she loves thinking very much, pondering on problems and creating things that work uh, not only on theory but in the real world too. So now we will hear more about her. Hi, um, I will talk uh, today about uh, evaluation metrics in classification and information retrieval. Um, I'm Katya and I got fascinated with natural language processing some time ago. Uh, it, was, it was really interesting how a machine can be so smart and so dumb in the same, uh, in the same time. Quite people like actually. Uh, I'm CTO at Maggio. Uh, this is a startup that uh, does machine learning and its main goal is to match candidates to jobs. And you can find me on Twitter and Medium. The talk today will start with some popular evaluation metrics and then I will tell you how, what kind of problems we had in Maggio and how we tackle them and how you can design your own metric. First, what is the typical machine learning development cycle? You want to do something, you want to be the next Google, you, you decide on some metrics that you want to use uh, in order to see uh, how good you are. Then you gather some data, you clean it, you build your machine learning model, evaluate the results, and you get a number, get something, you get 10, and you want to know what this means. And um, if you have a really low result, this could be a problem with your data, with your model, if you have a really great result, if you have 99%, there is also probably a problem with your data or with your metrics. Probably you didn't use the right metrics or you uh, gave your machine learning model your right answer or something like that. So no matter uh, if you get a good number or a bad number, you always have to analyze what this means, and it, um, it, could, it could be something all over the path. But I will just talk about the metrics. What could go wrong with the metrics? What I will do uh, is give you a series of setups and what kind of metrics are good for this kind of setups. Uh, I will st uh, start with uh, some classification metrics. Um, the setup is we have pictures of slots and pictures without slots. And we know that in our data there are 50% pictures of slots. And we want to have some metric that gives us a sense how good we are when we get, uh, when we classify documents. The easiest metric really is accuracy. You start with, uh, just say, all the true T here, um, the, the truly classified pictures uh, divided by all the pictures. If you have uh, 80 out of uh, 100 pictures that you have guessed right, 80% accuracy. Pretty straightforward, it works. What if uh, we don't have 50% slot pictures. We have only 1%. If we use the same metric, and we have algorithm that just says, there is no slot on any picture, we will get 99% accuracy. Because 99% of the time, we will be right. There will be no slot picture. But this metric is completely useless to us. Let's introduce confusion matrix. Uh, this is uh, what tells us um, how our guesses are distributed. How many of the pictures with slots we guess right? This is true positive. 
True negative is how many of the pictures without slots we guess right. False positive is when we have, uh, we said there is a slot there and there isn't, and false negative uh, if there is a slot, but we didn't guess it. So true positive is the obvious slots, true negative is the obvious pictures without slots, false positive is pictures without slots that look like there, there are slots on them, and false negative, uh, if there is a slot, but it doesn't really look like a slot picture. And these are just numbers, how many of all uh, the pictures we have guessed this way. What we can do now is use accuracy per class. You, we have the positive class, the class with slots on it, and the negative class, the class without slots on it. Um, we just want to get for the positive class how many of the pictures of slot we guess right. True positive divided by true positive plus false negative. And the same for uh, the negative accuracy. So, uh, and then we can just get the average of these two and this is our final accuracy. If the algorithm says there is no slot there, we will get 0% accuracy for uh, slot pictures and 100% accuracy for pictures uh, without slots. On average, 50%. These metrics represent what we want to get a lot better. What if we have a little bit different setup? If we have um, confidence, the algorithm gets you a confidence, how confident it is that there is a picture of slot uh, or not. If it's 90% sure there is a picture of slot, you say, okay, that's, that's good enough. But if it's 60% sure, you would ask a person to say if this, there is a picture of slot or not. But then, this, this doesn't give us, uh, it's not a bi really a binary um, problem anymore. So we need a little bit different uh, metric. In this kind of cases, logarithmic loss is used. The idea is that you, um, that you use the percentages of confidence of the algorithm, and you sum it for each, um, in each case. I will not get into details, but uh, there is the logarithmic loss, and it re represents this. Now imagine that you have a temple in a tropical forest, and that temple is frequently raided by sloths. And you want to um, install a camera. And that, this camera should, uh, should tell you when there are slots approaching, so you can do something about it. But of course, um, in a small percentage of the cases, there will be slots in the picture. So maybe we can use accuracy per class. But we don't really care that much if we get uh, picture without a slot, uh, and the algorithm says it is with slot, because we just can ignore this. It is a lot more important for us when we uh, have a picture with slots to know that th there is a slot on it. Let's introduce some more metrics. Um, what is precision? Precision is uh, the number of slots that we guess right, divided by the person, uh, the, the, the number of slots that we guessed at, uh, in total. So how many of the slots we guessed are slots are really slots. Precision is um, an interesting metric, but it is easily gamed. If you always say there is no slot there, you will never be wrong and you will get 100% uh, precision. Recall or true positive rate is how many of the slots that there are there we have managed to retrieve. 
again, this is a metric that is easily gamed. You always say there is a sloth, and you will retrieve all the sloths. 100% recall. So the, pre the precision and recall are not good by themselves. Uh, this is why F measure is used usually, because this is a kind of an average measure for precision and recall. What will happen, happen if we use F measure? If the algorithm always says there is a slot, um, then our precision will be zero, F measure zero. If the algorithm says there is no slots, uh, recall zero. Again, F measure is zero. And as a good average, if the precision and recall are equal, the F measure is equal to them. And if we have 30-70%, the arithmetic average is 50%, but F measure, F measure gives 42. Uh, F measure is always closer to the lower value. So it tries to penalize uh, when uh, some of the values some of the values is uh, lower. Can we do something to uh, get F measure to be better? Um, we can par parameterize it. If we parameterize it, we can give one uh, metric or the other more advantage, more weight. So if we choose the parameter three, we would give uh, recall more weight. And with 30% precision and 70% recall, we will get 52% F measure, which is higher there than the arithmetic average. So we can, uh, back to our uh, example with the temple in the forest, we want to get uh, a lot more recall than precision. This is what is important for us. So we can choose a parameter that weighs uh, more the recall, and voila, we have a metric. These were the classification metrics that I wanted to um, tell you about. Now about the information retrieval or the search metrics. If we have, if we want to create a search uh, for slots, and we know that there are 50% slot pictures in our data. What could we do? Let's start with um, false positive rate. This is a metric that tells us how, how many times we got it wrong. How many of the pictures that were not of slots, we, uh, we said are of slots. It is a negative uh, metric, so we wanted to minimize it. 0% is perfect. Again, it's easily, it, it is easy to achieve it. Always say there is no slot, and you can never be wrong. So we have the search results. First we get, um, first we get uh, picture of slot, then two wrong, and then everything else is a slot. What we can do is um, every time we get a picture at each posi position, we can calculate the, fo the false positive rate and the true positive rate, or recall. True positive rate is the other name of recall. So, um, at position one, um, we have uh, recall 2%. If we have 100 pictures and 50 of them are slots, uh, at position one, we will get recall 2, 2%. 2 and we uh, will have false positive rate 0%, because we haven't guessed anything wrong. And for each position, we can, guess, uh, we can get uh, the true positive rate and the false positive rate. Then we can plot this uh, on a graph. For every uh, recall, uh, what kind of false positive rate do we have? 
and it would, would look something like this. Now, um, if we just do a coin toss, uh, a coin toss <laughs> um, we will have around 50% uh, false positive rate. And, uh, well, we, will, we would be around the diagonal if we have just random uh, coin toss. So everything that's above this is actually good. This is uh, better, better, better than random. And then we can have different algorithms that give, give, uh, gives us different graphs, different curves. But then how do we compare them? We can just look at them and just say, okay, whichever is um, higher than the other is better. But sometimes we cannot really say which, which is higher. So we can, um, these curves are called rock curves, ROC curve. And in order to compare them, what we can do is uh, calculate the area under the curve. And this would give us a single number. So then we can compare these numbers and know which algorithm is better. Okay, we can use rock curve with area under the curve. But this metric is actually not very good if our classes are imbalanced, if we have only 1% slope pictures. We kind of get uh, the same problems as with accuracy. So for uh, imbalanced classes, what we can do is we can use um, precision and recall and do basically the same. For, for each point, calculate the precision and recall at that point. And we would get some numbers. Again, we can plot them. Uh, this time, um, in this time, the coin toss is this line, the red line, at 50%, because we would with coin toss, we would always get uh, around 50% precision, and it will just stay here. Mm. The perfect score, on the other hand, uh, would look a little bit different. The green line, the, this corner, is the perfect score. Uh, because in the beginning, if, uh, if you get uh, if you get the perfect score means that in the beginning you get all the pictures that are of slots and then all the pictures that are not of slots. So your precision in the beginning will always be 100% until you hit pictures uh, without slots and then it will drop. I want to point out that you don't have the positions on any axis. You just have corresponding precision and recalls points in this graph. So this is why everything looks a bit weird. The precision recall curve usually looks like this. Uh, it has a distinctive saw tooth look. And this is because of this. <laughs> you, in this case, we have six slots. And at, for, at the first position, we, have, we got one of the slots. So our recall is one-sixth. And it will continue to be one-sixth uh, until we get the next slot at position four. But until that time, our precision will fall. And this is exactly why, uh, why is this like this. So, we have our precision recall curve. What do we do next? Next. So, usually what is done is the curve is smooth, smoothed. We get only um, the points 
uh, at which the recall changes. So only the points at which we get a picture of a slot. And this smooths uh, how, uh, how the curve looks. And again, if we want to compare um, to curves, we can just compare the area under the curves. But this time, how are we going to calculate the area under the curve? We can just get um, the precision at all the points and sum this. This is called average precision. So at every point where there is um, a slot, get the precision and sum it up and divide it by the number of of slots that there are. Okay, so we get a number, 70%. Then we can get, if we shuffle a bit things, we see that uh, if we start with the pictures that are not of slots, the number is lower. If we get the perfect, uh, the perfect ordering, the uh, percent is 100%. Um, but this is for one search result. Usually what w we want to do is for every algorithm, run it for several search results and then get a number out of this. And we can use mean average precision. Uh, basically get the arithmetic average of all the search results. And then we can get a number for our search uh, algorithm. Or we can get the geometric mean average, which is uh, always lower uh, of, to the arithmetic. So if we want to penalize more for low scores, we would use geometric mean. This is the, uh, the metric that is quite good for imbalanced classes. Okay, um, what if we have search with different relevance? Not every picture is as valuable as the others. Um, we are searching for slots and we value live slots more than stuff slots. What we can do is uh, just sum up the relevance of all the pictures and we get some number. This is the cumulative gain. But the cumulative gain doesn't change if we shuffle things around. If first we get the stuffed uh, slots and then the live ones, it will stay the same. So we need something to uh, tell us something more about the ordering. We can use uh, discounted cumulative gain, which is basically we multiply the relevance of each picture by some parameter that corresponds to, to, the, to the position of this picture in the search results. Uh, this number is one over logarithm of the position. Uh, basically, uh, the, the more you go back uh, in the search, the less uh, weight you give to the discounted cumulative gain. Okay, so we use this formula, we get some result, okay, 5.12, something. It doesn't really say as much. We want to know what 5.12 means. We can, in order to understand it, we can uh, get the ideal discounted cumulative gain, which is if we have the perfect res search result, what, what would the discounted cumulative gain be then? And then we just normalize, divide all the discount, discounted cumulative gains by the ideal one. And voila, we have a number between zero and one. 
and now we know if it's one, it's perfect. If it's less than one, not so much. So this is um, what we can. This is what I have prepared to show you about classification and information retrieval um, metrics that exist. These are, these are the most popular ones, but there are a lot more into the wild. Now I wanted to tell you about uh, our use case. So, uh, Maju wants to match candidates and jobs. How would a recruiter do that? Well, a recruiter would typically have um, one job and a pool of candidates. And his first job would be to uh, categorize this pool of candidates in three categories. Good can perfect candidates, or ones, OK candidates, or twos, and candidates that the recruiter will never send to the client. Then, if there are perfect candidates, they will be sent to the client. If there aren't, uh, the OK ca candidates will be sent to the client. And if there are no good candidates, nobody will be sent to the client. OK. So our first metric was quite naive. What we would do is we get the number of perfect candidates. Um, in this example, we have four perfect candidates. Um, we would look at the first four results, and we will see how many true positives or perfect candidates are there, and how many really bad candidates are in the first four results. And um, just use this formula. Uh, the perfect candidates minus the bad candidates with some normalization. And this metric looks kind of OK in this case, 62%. But if we have a little bit different results, if we have only one perfect candidate and this candidate is in second place, we would only look at the first candidate. And if it's not good, we will, we will get 0% score. Which, this, this search result is not 0%, but our metric gives us that. So it's probably not a very good metric. So we decided to use a bit different um, metric. We used normalized mean average precision at points 5, 10, and 15. I will show you here with, um, two po with 5 and 10, because I don't have that much space. So um, mean average precision at point 5. Here, we, at point 5, we have three perfect candidates, which, which give us one point each, and one OK candidate, which gives us um, a third of a point. And we have 3.3 out of 5. And for all of them, 5.7 out of 10. So our score would be 38, 31.8. Then. We can calculate the, the best mean average precision and the worst, and we can get a normalized value. And know that this search result gives us 33% score, which is OK, uh, especially for, research, for our research purposes in the beginning. We wanted to get a good search result. But then we created a product. And our product behaved a little bit differently than our research setup. We had, uh, for every couple of candidate and, mat and job, we would get a score. 
And this core um, would mean something to us. We would know that below 10%, this is something that we should not show to the client. And uh, we, uh, if you do a search, we would only show you things that are above 10%. Okay, but then mean average precision uh, shows us how we ranked the uh, candidates, but it didn't. Uh, but if everyone was below 10%, we haven't returned anything to the client. So this uh, this number actually doesn't give us anything uh, in these cases. So what we do, what we did. their ordering, and this um, corresponds to the weight numbers we gave to F measure and average precision. So this is the value we arrived in the end. But then um, we really wanted to test how, how this metric feels, how our, our recruiters feel about these metrics. So. Um, First, what is interannotator agreement? This is annotators, or in our case, recruiters, how, how much of the time they agree that this ranking is a good ranking, or it's, is it a bad ranking? We wanted to test that, um, so we set up an experiment. We had four recruiters with 60 randomly generated rankings. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, we have uh, rankings of 20 candidates, and uh, we know that the first candidate is a one, the second candidate is a three, the third candidate is a two, and 60 rankings like this. The rankings were equally distributed with our score between one and 100. And then the annotators had to give score to the rankings between one and four. One, is, one being perfect and four being horrible. And it was important that we gave them an even number of uh, rankings because if uh, they, they couldn't give just a middle. If we have five, they couldn't give uh, three to anything. It had to be either good or bad. And we set up um, a little bit, uh, a little trap. Two of the rankings were twice, but in different contexts. Once they were uh, among other good rankings, and once among other bad rankings, in order to see if there is inter-annotator agreement among a one, one annotator. And the, then it is very it, important to know what would you accept as interannotator agreement. We wanted to um, at least three of our annotators to agree on a ranking to, to get it into our interannotator agreement. What were the results? The interannotator agreement wasn't that high. It was a little bit over 50%. And there were two groups of annotators, the strict ones and the useful ones. They looked at the task in a different way. So it was very important for us to do this experiment uh, because it started a conversation. Our annotators had to agree what is good and what is, and what is bad. What the client would want. Also, some of the annotators didn't have inter-annotator agreement among themselves. Uh, two of the annotators gave different score to the trap rankings in different contexts, which was also interesting. 
Uh, but apart from that, what we found out about our metric was that the higher the score the, score the machine gives, the higher the score people give. So that was good. It meant that our metric is useful. It's good enough. And we could uh, get some thresholds and say, OK, be below this limit, this is a bad ranking. Above this limit, it's good ranking. So we had a metric, and we could use it. What I want you to get out of this lecture is that there are a lot of metrics. And um, if, if you really have a messy problem, a real world problem, you have to think about what kind of metric you're going to use. You cannot just pick something and we're going to optimize on that. Non, uh, no metric could be used in all cases, but they're useful. You just have to figure out what is useful in your case. And you can, if there's, there is nothing out there, you can craft it yourself. And keep in mind that if one person tells you that this is a bad metric, maybe there is another that, tells you, that would tell you that it is a good metric. People don't usually agree in the beginning of the process. So experiment with people. It's good. And that's for me. We have time for questions, so if someone wants to ask something, you receive a cue. Hello? Oh, thanks. Um, so I would like to ask, uh, if you have a skewed data set, wouldn't you prefer to filter it out first to balance the classes and then make the model on top of it? Well, it depends. Um, uh, if your real world data will be like this, you, may, uh, you might want to work with uh, the data. It, it, it depends, really, because in some cases, you wouldn't have enough data, and you would uh, want to do something about it and to hack it into your problem. But if you can work with the data the way it is presented uh, in the real world, that would be the best. Yeah, thank you. Are there any questions, other questions? Okay, thank you very much.